Well, our scripture this morning is just a little, a couple of verses from Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two is a uh, is an account of the early church, and we'll talk about the early church and and what they did back in that day. So Acts chapter two. And we'll read verse 46 and verse 47. Hear God's inspired word. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. May God bless his word to us. Today's message is entitled Fellowship Around the Table. And uh, in a few weeks, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper again. And uh, so today we're kind of doing a little bit of preparatory work, uh, thinking ahead of when the next time we celebrate communion at the Lord's table and how we can get be prepared for that time. You know, it's, it's great to read about the American Revolutionary War and the ideals and the ideas that the founders of the revolution held dear. And they wanted to enshrine in the Articles of Confederation and later in the United States Constitution. The preamble to the Constitution begins by saying, we, the people. You know, that's unique. Because in many countries at that time, they were ruled by kings. And, uh, and, and here we say the power rests with we, the people. That's very fitting because Tuesday, we'll, we, the people, will go to the polling. And... Uh, uh, those 13 colonies would embark on a journey that no people had ever traveled. Uh, those patriots, they would seek God's divine guidance and forge a nation that was built on liberty, the Christian faith, and the Holy Bible. When we read the first chapters of, of the book of Acts, we see that the Bible Comment, we see what the Bible commentator Matthew Henry calls, and I quote, the history of the truly primitive church of the first days of it, its state of infancy indeed, but like that, the state of its greatest innocence. You know, at that time, there was a freshness in the church. They, they took Jesus at his word. And they were empowered and guided by the Holy Spirit. You know, we need to do that in the church today. Be empowered and guided by the Holy Spirit to direct us in our worship, in our life, and what we say and do in our work. And we need to rely upon the Holy Spirit to draw people into our fellowship and in, uh, uh, at the workplace and other places in our neighborhoods and here at the church, the, the Holy Spirit, we need to pray that he will work in the hearts and minds uh, of people, men, women, and children. When you read the second chapter of Acts, when I, when I read it, maybe you too, I wish I could enter a time machine. There is no such thing, but I wish... I could enter a time machine and I could go back uh, to about 33 A.D. in Jerusalem to witness the excitement, the freshness, and the power that Jesus was giving this fledgling church. You know, I hope we develop a deep desire to be more and more an Acts 2 church a church that follows and believes in what was happening, taking place in that early church. That we feel a, a fresh breeze blowing through our congregation, an excitement and a joy that comes from Christ. 
and from His Spirit. Well, today is preparatory Sunday, even though we're a little bit early. Um, and we hope to, that uh, soon that we will gather around this communion table and to celebrate our Lord's death, His shed blood and His body that was, was given for our sins. But this week, it's good for us to examine our lives and to prepare to eat that bread and to drink from the cup on that Lord's Day. And we are going to do something different today, and uh, we're going to uh, think about the Lord's Supper, not the week before, but a few weeks be before. And, and then later on, on a Sunday, we'll dig into uh, what the, ver the previous verses of this passage have to say to us as well. And verse 46 begins by saying, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. You know, those early Christians, they no longer wanted to go to the temple to make sacrifices because Jesus, the Lamb of God, had given his own body and he had shed his life's blood on the cross for, for their sins. No longer did the priests need to offer up the, the, bl uh, the blood of bulls and, and goats and sheep and turtle doves because the price for their sins and our sins had been paid for when Jesus died at, at Calvary. The sacrifice that Jesus gave was a sweet smell, a pleasing sacrifice to the one who justifies. Well, there are three thoughts I want to bring out this morning. And one, uh, it, we see that they began, uh, the early church that began with each day with some time in corporate worship. And that corporate worship took place at, at the temple in Jerusalem. And probably the place was called Solomon's Colonnade. And there they came. And one of the things they came to do is to pray. And, and they thank God for sending Jesus, the Messiah, to fulfill all the Old Testament, Testament uh, prophecies when he died for our sins. For not only so many weeks before Jesus had, had walked in those temple courts, remember when he drove out the money changers? Because he didn't want his father's house to, to be a place of business but he wanted it to be a house of prayer for all nations. And he saw that there, was, there, was, uh, there were money changers, tables, and there were animals that were there for sacrifice, and you could buy your animals there and all that. And there was no room for the Gentiles, for that court where the Gentiles who would come and, uh, and uh, they converted to Judaism and they would come there and, and to worship as well. There was no room for them. And, and the Lord wanted anyone who wanted to come to the temple to worship to be able to come. And especially those who had a designated place that was now being used for, for business. I am sure that these, these early Christians prayed for their families. They prayed for their friends. And I am sure that they prayed for those hard-hearted Pharisees and Sadducees who had earlier cried out for Christ's death. You know, joyful worship, earnest prayer, and forgiveness for others should be a part of our worship. Every Sunday it should be a part of our worship, and it should take place before we partake of the Lord's Supper. The sacraments are only for the believer. And the believer should exhibit a life that is filled with regular worship and, and prayer and, and forgiveness for others as the Lord has forgiven us. We know that the Lord accepted their praise and that he heard their prayers on behalf of those non-believing Jews. We read later in Acts that many of, of those Pharisees and Sadducees the ones who had cried out for Jesus' death. Many of them came, and they became Christians themselves, and they believed in Jesus as the Messiah. And while they were 
growing in, in their vertical relationship with God, they were also growing in their horizontal relationship with each other. And we call that Christian fellowship. Now notice in the last part of verse 46, they broke bread. That's our second point. They worshipped and they broke bread. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. You know, in a healthy church, there is fellowship. When people are worshiping on Sunday morning, and there is fellowship in small groups, in our homes, and, and other settings in, during the week. You know, our church, our church has a fellowship hall. And uh, a lot of times we're around the tables and we're eating together. And, uh, and, and some think fellowship is belly ship, you know, that we just eat, and that's fellowship. Fellowship is far more than, than that. It, it's far more than that. And uh, I remember back in Montana, we had a small church there in Helena, and uh, our church needed to be re-roofed. Yeah, the, the roof was getting old, and the steeple up on top, it was made of wood, and it, and it was kind of rotten, and so it needed to be done, but we didn't have the money to have a roofer, to hire a roofer for, say, $20,000 to re-roof the church, so we talked about it, and we said, we can do it, and uh, the men and a couple of young ladies went up on the roof, and we also had some who made meals and snacks for us. Coffee time, you know, you got to have that too. And, uh, and so we were up there on the roof working together. And, you know, we had fellowship around the tables when we were having our snack time and our, our noon meal. We also had fellowship up on that roof when you're working together. And, and you're, you're tearing off shingles and you're pulling out nails and, and you're nailing down uh, the felt paper and you're also nailing those shingles to, to the roof. There's fellowship up there. We, we laugh together and, and we talk together. We even had a council meeting up there on the roof. Uh, we had to decide and somebody said, this steeple is not, should we try to save it or should we just uh, get rid of it? And we had our council meeting up there. We said, we're going to get rid of it right now. We, we threw it in the dumpster. And, uh, and so uh, uh, we had lots of good fellowship up there on that roof. Sometimes our concept of, of fellowship is, is limited. Most congregations, you know, like I said, have a, uh, a fellowship hall. But there's genuine fellowship in, in the church sanctuary in our homes together. Sometimes, you know, we, we meet together in, in our homes and we have fellowship. And there's other settings as well, maybe in the restaurant. You know, we see that those early Christians, they broke bread together. And as we see in verse 42, uh, Dr. Luke, he said there was the breaking of bread. Now we need to look at that, have a careful look. You know, most Bible scholars say that in verse 42, the phrase breaking of bread, that in that passage, in that verse, it meant the Lord's Supper, that they were, that they were having the Lord's Supper together. And, and then in verse 46, we read, they broke bread in their homes. And the commentators think that in that setting, it meant that they ate together. And so they ate together. They, they fellowshiped together around the table. They ate supper together or lunch together. But they also had fellowship around the communion table. You know, it's great that some of you get together after the church service on Sunday mornings. And, and uh, we have a cup of coffee or something cold to drink and a cookie or or a, a brownie, and this morning there's some things out there too, and we talk together. And, and some people don't even make it to the, to the cookies. They're over here in this area, and you, you know who you are, and they're just having a great time fellowshipping together, and that's good. You don't have to rush over there to the cookies and, and coffee, but you're having a good time. 
and and that's great. And, and then uh, uh, in Montana, well, we had young couples and singles, and they they would meet during the week, and, and they ha- they would meet with with a fire pit in the backyard of one of the one of the couples, and and they would uh, roast marshmallows and other things, and they would have a Bible study together, and they grew together, and they grew spiritually. And then there's the ladies, uh, ladies group, uh, the Bible study group. Uh, I remember uh, the one that we had over at uh, in Montana, and there's ladies groups here too. And uh, from my study, I could hear their fellowship, and they were laughing together and having a great time together studying God's word. And you could tell that they had the joy of the Lord. And and maybe if someone came, they'd say. Ooh, what are they drinking? Well, you know, but they know that they have the joy of the Lord. And, and you can have a lot of fun, a lot of fellowship with drinking a, a Coca-Cola or a cup of coffee together. Those early first century Christians, they were full of the joy of the Lord. You know, sometimes at a funeral of a loved one, we might be somewhat solemn or even shed tears. But even at those times, the Christian is full of the joy of the Lord. You know, when that, when that loved one who has departed and gone on to meet with Jesus, we can rejoice because they're fellowshipping with him. They know him. And we know, too, that someday, if we love Jesus and if we trust in him for our salvation, we'll be with them. We'll be We'll be in fellowship again there in in heaven. When I was thinking about this fellowship, the breaking of bread together, I was reminded of of a verse in the book of Amos, Amos chapter 3, verse 3, that says, How can two walk together unless they agree to do so? You know, it's, it's hard to walk together or ride in a car with someone where there's tension or hostility. Why Solomon, Solomon, he wrote in Proverbs 15, verse 17, better is a meal of vegetables where there is love than a fattened calf with hatred. And then again in in Proverbs 17, verse 1, better is a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting and strife. Do you think Solomon spoke from experience from the times that he could remember when he was eating with his around his father's table with all his brothers and sisters and 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 the tension that was there sometimes? Was there ever tension at Solomon's dinner table when he ate with some of his wives, some of his wives who even worshipped other gods? When there's peace in the family of God, when when we sit at the table of the Lord, our Lord is pleased. Our Lord is pleased and people are blessed when there's that peace. And the church grows and the church grows. That's the third thought. The church grows. When genuine and sincere worship takes place and sincere and joyful fellowship is experienced, the church grows grows. And I've seen that over and over again. That's a fact. When there's tension in a church, when there's fighting going on in a church, people are headed for the exit. And and, uh, people might come as a visitor, they might come once, and they could just sense, they could just smell and see the tension in the church, and they'll never be back again. How sad. Because there has to be Joyful fellowship. In verse 47, the early church enjoyed the favor of all the people. When genuine worship takes place, when God's people break bread together uh, at potlucks or roasting hot dogs and burgers around a glowing fire, or when they divide a, a pepperoni pizza uh, around someone's kitchen table, there's fellowship. And that fellowship is noticed by others. Other people within the church notice that fellowship. 
And people outside the church, they notice that. You see that the, the love and the joy of the church in action is contagious. There's a book about evangelism. It's called The Contagious Christian. And people should see us and should say, you know, I want what he has. I want what she has. And you know, if, if we are genuine in, in the workplace and in our neighborhood and we share our faith, and people are going to see us. And they're going to start asking us questions. And I found that, you know, I worked in the, in the workplace too. I've been in a, worked in a factory. And I had one young man, he, every time we ate and had, or had lunch or uh, were on a coffee break, he was asking me questions. And he was asking me questions about God and about Jesus and, and about heaven and all these things. I didn't start asking him those questions or trying to get him prompt him, but he was asking me those questions. And you will find the same thing in your life if you're genuine and if you are a, a Christian who's committed to the faith and joyous. The, re, the re, uh, results of genuine worship, that Christian fellowship, results in evangelism. Some of you, maybe you feel... a an icy chill up your spine right now. Evangelism. Yeah, pastor's going to ask me to share the four spiritual laws with someone or something else. No, I'm not going to ask you to do that. Evangelism is just living out the Christian faith. What you learn here and what you learn in Bible study and your own personal uh, devotions, that you live that out in, in the marketplace and in other settings. And people will notice that you belong to Jesus. Our scripture says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, the early church didn't have a, a three or four point evangelistic program in the church or a high powered advertising campaign. But they did experience what we would call natural church growth. That's what they experienced. The church history writers recorded that when the pagans noticed those believers, they remarked how they love one another. And I, is that the way it is with those who visit us and those from our community when they go by or they attend things here? And do they notice how they love one another? That says a lot, you know. That could be the best thing that anyone could say about Ham and Church if they say how they love one another. They saw the love of Jesus in those folks. The Bible says they could see that they had been with Jesus. And when you and I spend time with Jesus and we love the body of Christ, you can believe that the world will take notice. When God's people pray together, the hearts and, and the minds of those around us will be naturally drawn to Jesus. We can lead people to Jesus, but we can't make them believe. Notice, it is the Lord who added to their number daily. It was the Lord. Oh, they didn't twist arms and, and beat people over the head with their, with their Bibles but it was the Lord who added to their number daily. You and I cannot lead a person to Christ and change their heart. You and I can share with them the gospel, but it's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, who changes hearts and minds. No one can come to the Father, Jesus said, unless he draws him. And each one of us here in this place, it was the Spirit of God who drew us here and who drew us to Jesus so that we might know him and, and, and love him as our Savior. No person who is spiritually dead can come to God, repent of their sins, and believe in Jesus as their Lord and, and their Savior unless it is the Lord who adds to his church. And the Lord will do that. We see, I should say, we are so oh so in the, so dependent on him to grow the church spiritually and 
numerically. Does that mean those Jewish believers didn't share their faith with family members or neighbors? No. They were so thankful. And they were excited. You can just sense that excitement from this second chapter of Acts. They were excited about their faith and they told everyone who would listen to them uh, about Jesus. When we observe the, that early church, we see joyful worship. And I say joyful worship. Fellowship that is expressed around the tables. And thirdly, and when we read the words of Dr. Luke, we learn about real God-centered natural evangelism where non-believers were drawn by God and by the loving fellowship that they saw experienced in that Acts chapter 2 church. Let's rely upon the Holy Spirit and ask the Lord to make uh, those of us here at Hammond Christian Reformed Church more and more like the church that we heard about this morning. Let's pray. Father, we ask that, that you would prepare us, our hearts, for when we will gather around your table in the, in the near future. May, may this congregation be known for our sincere, our biblically-based worship by the joyful fellowship that we experienced around the, uh, around the communion table and also around the tables in our fellowship hall, and by the new folks and the moms and the dads, the widows, the singles, the youth, the ones you regularly add to our numbers, those who are turning to Jesus alone for their salvation from the guilt and the sin that burdens them. May each one of us seek peace with God and strive to make peace with our brothers and sisters in this fellowship with our neighbors. Father, we ask that you would make this congregation here at Hammond more and more like the Acts to church that we read about this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.